Hey everybody, uh, happy Sunday. Welcome to Etc. on the Vive Live. I'm your host, Kelly Barrett. We are in the midst of prog rock royalty today, friends. I have in the house with me tonight, Michael Sadler and Jonathan Mover of Project. Welcome, guys. Hey, good evening. Good to be here. <laughs> How you doing? Everybody looks great. Michael's got his headphones on and and, and his beard, and, and Mover's about to not have a beard the mm-hmm. next time we see him. <laughs> but you look lovely. Special <laughs> just for today. <laughs> He's doing it gradually. He's starting with the headphones and then he'll do the beard. Right, just the, the paring down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, it's great. Oh, people are popping in already. Hi, Brad's eyeball is just saying, wow, right on. He's been waiting for this all week. Thanks for joining us, buddy. Uh, hey, guys, we have so much to talk about with the, with the project. Um, I, I kind of feel like first, though, I just, you know, I just want to mention the very sad passing of Ellen White and offer condolences to yourselves as well as the Absolutely. rest of the prog, prog music community. I'm sure that probably really deeply affected you. Yeah, that reverberated big time. Yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't have the good fortune of uh, being able to meet Alan when he was. I, actually, I met him in passing uh, very quickly on one of the cruises, uh, one of the cruise to the mm-hmm. edge uh, uh, outings that we did. But uh, yeah, very sad day to hear that news. Right. And Mover, you, you probably knew him as well. I just wanted to mention that. It's just yeah, uh, for kind a of a little, long, long little shout out. Ta- very talented, talented yeah. musician. So. Goes without saying, he was an influence and a very, very nice guy. And as much as he was a prog god with yes, I mean, he had one hell of a career with working yeah. with everybody from John Lennon across the board. He was really quite accomplished and a, and a sweet guy. Yeah. Right, right. Well, rest in peace. Yeah, for sure. So um, I, I want to get a little background. And I know you guys probably get really, really tired of sort of regurgitating your whole past. But I think for artists like you, you have such an impressive background of experiences. And and I think it needs to be to mention, you know, the, the work that you both did prior to Project. And then we're going to get to Project. Uh, Jonathan, can I start with you? If Michael doesn't mind. No, no, no. And I prefer to, to, to refer to us as seasoned veterans. Or seasoned veterans. Seasoned professionals. There you go. All right. Professionals kind, is good. What kind of seasoning? Am uh, I, I, I'm, better with, I'm better with time. Ah. Oh, oh, oh brunch. I see what okay. you did there, Michael. <laughs> well, you can call me Rosemary. <laughs> I'd rather not. Brunch. Better Thank you. Better. We're here all week. Try the veal. Oh. <laughs> Speaking oh no! So, suddenly, I'm back on the bus. This I was just going to say, this is what <laughs> this is what we went through for 34 days. <laughs> right on. So, Jonathan, do you want to just tell us a little bit about how you got into this crazy business and and why was it drums or was it always drums for you? Um, it's an interesting question because I've been asked this a lot lately, and yeah. my stock answer, which is the truth, I found out recently there's more to it, and somebody would just asking me like you know what were the first records you got what was your first real musical influence and you know i tell this story when we play live about when i first heard elp on the radio and you know keith emerson blew my mind and i'll get to that in a second but i have about five or six thousand lps still even though i don't play them much and i went and i looked at them last week and going through them i realized that aside from the beatles because they were in the family my very first record that I ever got was The Point by Harry Nilsson. Oh. And after that, I had records by um, Harry Chapin and Gordon Lightfoot. And I realized that I was really captivated by the storytelling, same with the Beatles, before I actually was listening to the instruments and the music that was being played. Um, oh. As far as drums go, my first foray into drumming was after hearing my older brother play in a gata de vida and the <laughs> story is i told my folks i wanted to play drums so they signed me up for drums in elementary school and, and like a, two or three days into it i found myself not only standing at a snare drum with drumsticks the size of baseball bats but i was playing in a kids orchestra with 29 other kids that couldn't play their instruments like i couldn't And my idea of drums was sitting down on a drum kit and rocking out. It wasn't, you know, trying to play a Sousa march. And so I gave up on drums the first time around. But then, as Michael knows, when I heard Lucky Man on the radio a year or two later, and I heard the outro solo with Keith Emerson playing a Moog, I really wanted to investigate what that was. And I asked my parents, this was probably 73, so I was about 10 years old. I asked my parents if they would buy me the um, the ELP record. When we went to the record store and I thumbed through the ELP bin, I saw the cover of Brain Salad Surgery. And even though Lucky Man wasn't on it, that was the record I had to have. 
And as soon as I heard that music, Carnival 9, you know, the first, second, and third impression, and going back to the storytelling, especially the third impression with the robot and the computer that took over man, and I was just completely captivated. And then right. to finish, when I flipped the record over and I heard Takata, which has a drum solo in it that incorporates Moog synthesizer drums, that was it. I got right back to drumming. My parents had a neighbor that was kind enough to loan me a drum kit, and I just started playing. And the rest is history. Mm -hmm. And the rest is, and you went on, uh, you know, maybe we'll skip over you uh, just for your beginnings, uh, Michael, and then we'll skip back to some of the other projects that you were in. Mover. But how was it for you, Michael? How did this unfold for you, this musical journey? Um, the, the present journey with the project or I mean, saga, previous, previous to project. Uh, I mean, Saga, it's, it's been 45 years, yeah. believe it or not, this year. 1977. Our very first gig is coming up, uh, the anniversary of which is on June 13th. It'll be exactly 45 years from the first show. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank Congratulations. You. Yeah, for oh, sure. You joined them when you were two. That's amazing. Yes. Yes, <laughs> it's absolutely right. You started young. <laughs> Your check's you in the mail. You know, 20 bucks. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, you know, it's two thirds of my life is spent uh, spent with Saga. But, um, you know, some, some various uh, high school bands before that. Uh, but really, I mean, the, the, my my musical upbringing really was apart from the you know being influenced by the the, the material that we're playing in project. Um, it's been saga for like I say for that that for that whole time. So. Right, and how I mean, amazing! Yeah, how amazing is that? Because you don't often see that anymore. Like bands with that type of longevity, and people still want to. I had Jim Jim Gilmore's been on the show, and and you guys are you just came back from was it Puerto Rico? Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. you know, forty-five years, and people still want to hear it. They love it. They still want to see it. It's it's it. remarkable. I mean, uh, these days, I I would defy any band to last, you know, maybe more than five, ten years uh, max, because the I mean, the musical landscape is so different. Um, it, it's you know, we've lasted this long uh, because of the fans. You know, the people want to hear what we're doing, and and we still have a lot of creative, uh, creative input and and things to to uh, to. We don't have anything to prove anymore, uh, no, but, we, we, not, we no. st <laughs> but we still got a lot of, of creativity in us. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we'll keep doing it till I keep saying that, you know, I'll keep walking on stage until I can't till they wheel me on, <laughs> on stage in a wheelchair. Then I'll say, you know what? I think I've got to pack it in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right on, right on. Yeah, super good. And, and so, Mover, you you played with some other fairly well-known apps as well. You've got quite a quite a quite a seasoned veteran resume yourself. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, for me, I grew up in a small town north of Boston, and Boston was very fertile when I was in high school and, and before, you know. I mean, some of the great bands that came out of there, The Car is one of my favorites, and of yeah. course, Boston and Jay Giles. By the time I graduated <laughs> high school, though, that Boston scene was over, and I also didn't grow up playing in cover bands. Um, you know, I was in my basement at 14, 15, 16, practicing to Zappa, and Gentle Giant and Genesis and, you know, the Bruford stuff in UK. So I didn't really go out there and ever have the mindset of being a member of a band with a bunch of friends from high school, right. um, which isn't bad. I mean, that's a great thing. It's just not the avenue I went down. So when I graduated high school and was thinking about do I go to university, what do I do? And I checked out into a few schools. I really just thought I have to go out there and, and get it, you know, for myself. And of course, New York was an option. I had been there through high school and played a few times. L.A. I had been to. Um, but 99 percent of everything I loved in music, with exception to like, you know, Frank Zappa and some Utopia and a few other right. Americans, it was all English. It was all British Prague. So I decided to go over to London after high school and, um, you know, just hanging out and meeting people and auditioning. And one thing led to another. And I'm I'm very fortunate and blessed that it worked out. Right, right. And so Project uh, was formed in 2020, was it? It's only a couple of years old, isn't it? What is Project? Project, no, it was, it's, it hasn't, it's been uh, yeah, formed exactly. recently, right? It's about three years, um, right. but of course everything was put on hold. Um, but yeah, we I made the phone calls and got the connections to Michael and everybody in, I believe, literally April of 2019. So it was about, you know, just over three years ago, and it was pretty quick and pretty immediate. I don't remember the first time we actually got together and rehearsed. Um, we in the West Coast were playing first, and then after a bit, Michael came in, and it was just immediate. 
Right. And so you, my understanding, Jonathan, is that you kind of handpicked the lineup that's in this band. Um, I like. I handpicked, but it was also offered to me. I mean, the, again, the right. quick story is I had gotten a last minute as a freelance player. Um, I always get a last minute call mostly to, you know, either go into the studio and ghost drum or fix a record or jump on a tour if there's a drummer sick or there's a problem. So I got a last minute call to go on tour with a Canadian band called The Musical Box, which is a Genesis tribute band. And um, I had heard of them, but I didn't know too much about it. Anyway, I flew out and uh, was on stage with them the day after they called me. And within the first minute of playing that early Genesis in front of a live crowd, I was catapulted back to being 14 or 15 years old. And it was a you know reminder of what I love so much about music and why I really began drumming and following prog rock anyway. So I did a few weeks with them until their drummer got his visa and or until they, you know, to work somebody out, work somebody in. And I got back to LA and for the first time in a very long time, I was really bummed out. Not depressed, but you know, something was missing. And I just said, uh, I can't believe how much fun that was playing that Genesis material. I can't believe there's an audience for it. And I can't believe um, there's a lot of money to be made in it because the musical box. <laughs> <are very good. laughs> and so I said to myself, um, how can I continue this love affair? But I don't want to be in a tribute band. You know, I don't want to play note for note or dress up right. like somebody. I love all prog. So what about doing a tribute to a genre? So literally about a week after I was um, home um, and I had the thoughts about everything, I put it to paper and I asked a couple of friends and one person recommended Rio Okamoto and actually m mentioned Mike Keneally, but Mike wasn't available at the time and a few other people. And then uh, the, a few days later, I was back on the East Coast doing a Prague interview. And after the interview was over, uh, you know, I, I really have to learn how to say his name. Is it Alan Belegeron? I, I think it's Bayerjean. Bayer, okay. So he... He, he's a, a prog nut who's got a great podcast and everything, and he's on the East Coast uh, back in Massachusetts, and I was back visiting my mom at the time, and I was interviewed by him. We talked about Musical Box and, and GTR and Marillion and everything else, and, uh, and when we were offline, I said, you know, by the way, I've got this idea, and I told him about it, and I said, I've got a few people in mind that I'm going to call when I get back to L.A., um, do you have a bass player and a singer in mind? Is there anybody you can think of? And, you know, when I, when my other friend, Eric, mentioned Keneally, my first thought was, well, you know, I just saw Keneally six months ago with Satriani. I went to see him in L.A. So, you know, Mike's busy. He's not going to be interested in this. And when he mentioned Michael Sadler, I said the same thing to him and myself. Michael's still singing with Saga. You know, yeah. he's not going to be available. Anyway, I went back to L.A. and Alan called me a few days ago and said I spoke to Sadler. Here's his number. Give him a call. He's interested. And it was really as easy as that. Wow. And Michael, you're such an obvious choice. Like, I mean, prog rock gold. And that, and that's just coming from my heart. Like, obvious choice, right? And what a lineup. When I saw the lineup for this band, I was I was gobsmacked. And then I watched the YouTube, the montage, you know, of the songs with the, you know, the Rush and the Pink Floyd. And, and I love the concept, Jonathan, of not being a tribute band, per se, but, like, paying, paying homage to an entire genre. Right. Yeah. Because I, I think um, in some ways, you know, that you don't have, there's not as much prog rock. Maybe it's just me, but, you know, in the 70s and 80s, we had all these, you know, the Yes and the Jethro Tull and the King Crimson and the Rush. And, the, <laughs> and uh, so I think what a, what a super great idea to bring that all back for the prog rock fans like, to, to continue that. And, 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 and Yeah, and new fans alike. I mean, I, I think, yeah. it's, I think it's, it's circling back and people are uh, either rediscovering the genre or going, wow, where has this genre been all my life? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, that, that, that's the, that, the, that's the beauty of it is, is almost feel like ambassadors out there and, and, you know, uh, playing this music for, for new audience. We're seeing younger people coming to the shows and, and really getting excited by it. And that's a really good sign to me because, you know, it's a, it's an older genre and, and the, the demographic is an older one for now, uh, because it's, it's, you know, we're not spring chickens by any, by any measure ourselves and the audience, but, uh, the concern obviously is if you don't get a, a younger audience into the any genre, not just the prog one, or, but any genre. If you uh, you don't cultivate a new audience, the genre will will fade away, and right. uh, you know eventually perhaps die and 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 become non-existent. 
right we can't like we can't let that happen it's too important right. a genre so mm -hmm. you know it, it's it's great to see a lot of like i say new younger generations coming out to see the shows and, and being really turned on by this music so. right what a testament like what a testament to the genre of music that it, it's spanning generations and now exactly exactly you know, well it's 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 timeless it really is because it doesn't represent you know a certain uh, era, uh or, era or musical taste yeah. at the time exactly so there's no real time stamp on it apart from when certain things were recorded but the mm -hmm. type of music that it is can it's, it's like classical music it just it transcends time and, and uh, generations and, mm -hmm. and you know, it, it's also so much more broad than a lot of people think because you okay. know everybody knows genesis and and yes and a bit of elp and some crimson but as michael and i immediately you know uh agreed with each other how much we love like gentle giant and oh. you know even though there are some people in the audience that know almost everything we play i'm i'm really uh happy after the shows when people come up and say oh man you know that was amazing what was that song you played after roundabout or you know what was that before rush and right. and then you say oh that was a medley from the bill bruford solo band or that was gentle giant or that was uk and then all of a sudden, you know, their horizons are expanded and they're turned on right. to new music, even though it's 30 or 40 years or 50 years old, it, it's exciting exactly. all over again. Exactly. Right, and to, just to spread that and, and like you said, broaden people's horizons. And the one thing I really love about prog music is that it's, I kind of refer to it as musician's music. You know, the fans love it. Other yes. musicians really respect it. Yeah, yes, very much you know, so. Very because much it's, so. Yeah. it's not simple three chord rock and roll. Like, you know, it's no, <laughs> not by any stretch of the imagination. No. <laughs> right, yeah. And so there's a whole lot of respect among, among the community. And uh, yeah. um, actually, Andy, we're, we're getting a ton of comments and questions here. Andy Christ, I love that name, says, Jonathan Mover, what a resume. Who else would you want to work with if you had the chance? Oh, unfortunately, uh, well, I was going to say, unfortunately, most of the people I really dreamed of playing with are no longer with us. Um, you know, Frank Zappa was a dream of mine. And of course, uh, Jaco Pastorius was somebody I always wanted to play with. Um, but believe it or not, if, if like off the top of my head, I, I had to, you know, tell you who I'd really love to play with. Emmy Lou Harris is somebody that I would actually kill to have oh. the gig with. I love Emmy Lou Harris. Um, I'm a big Floyd of a uh, big Floyd. I'm a big fan of Pink Floyd. So obviously working with either David or Roger would be wonderful. Um, you know, they're really, if I had to think about it, there's a long list. There are so many people out there, Jeff Beck, et cetera, et cetera. You go on um, and on, eh? But in all seriousness, I am so happy playing this music with project. Um, I, I can't think of doing anything else. And and um, this really is what I want to do. It's the music I love to play. I couldn't ask to be playing with better musicians. You know, Michael was mind blowing when he came in and was singing like he sounded 20, 30, 40 years ago. I mean, seriously, yeah. everybody has stepped up to the plate and given me a platform to do what I want to do. And <laughs> one thing I really love is when I'm playing with people around me that make me rise to the occasion. Right, challenge you. Right? Yeah, and yeah. this is definitely a challenge. I mean, you know, to have Michael singing like that in front, to have Keneally playing some solos and doing things and real rippings. I mean, it's just crazy. I look yeah. around at me and right. I say, like, how lucky am I? And right. I hope I'm getting better and better, which the band just got better and better every day. Right. Yeah. And my thoughts. I mean, it's the same thing for me standing there as, yeah. a, as a vocalist, having this arsenal behind you. It's, it's remarkable. It's just, you know, but you're right about, I mean, rising to the occasion and, and, and being the best you can be for your fellow uh, musicians on stage. And and, uh, and also the, the thing about Prague, I was going to go back to it just for a second. It's, sure. it's, it's more fun than people think it is. They, they think Prague is such a serious genre. It's not. It's a lot of fun. And mm -hmm. and if you can, if you see us play, um, it smiles from the beginning of the sh uh, show to the end. We were having we we're having so such a blast on stage. Uh, I you know it's it's I mean I love being on stage period, but this one uh, this this project is just you know it's 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 such a delight every night to get on stage. The only bummer, the only bummer is how quickly two and a half hours go. It's by. remarkable. Oh it's yeah, remarkable. No, no, no. And we, we've got one seriously packed set and yeah, yeah. you know, it's a marathon. 
And I can't believe, you know, the next thing I know, we're we're waiting to do the encore. And I, re I remember that from the very first show when we were backstage going, OK, here we go. And I'm looking at the set list going, wow, you know, we were going to labor over this. This is going to feel like an eternity. And right. like you said, before we knew, it's like, what do you mean? It's, it's It felt like 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Right, well, you just um, feed off you feed off the audience and, you, you oh, know, I would imagine always, you get that reaction. Always, and it's always, just like, always. Yeah. Yeah. That's a ball. Yeah. Right. And so do you feel like, uh, this is a question I have for you, do you feel like, uh, you know, pertaining to, and I haven't really toured Canada much with this band, but do you think there's a difference uh, between American audiences and say Canadian audiences as far as the prevalence of prog rock? We we haven't had a chance to to do any Canadian shows as of yet. Uh, we're we're right. working on that, but- um, So John, uh, they, I mean, you know, Canada is a very, very uh, fertile prog market. I mean, in fact, uh, if you, especially with uh, the Quebec, pro the problems of Quebec, uh, a lot of uh, British bands broke out of like Genesis, I think, was one of the first uh, uh, Quebec was one of the first places they broke in North America, Supertramp as well. So Prague is alive and well in, in Canada and there's, there's pockets of it all, right across the country. So we're, we're, we're going to make our way up there eventually for sure. That's great. Yeah, Jonathan was mentioning that. And, mm -hmm. and, and you just finished a tour in like across the States, like just a couple of weeks ago, right? Or a week ago? Mm -hmm. A few weeks ago, yeah. We did one gig in LA at my facility, which was, um, you know, kind of a warm up, <laughs> a full set to a paid audience. And then we jumped on a, a tour bus for about two and a half days and we started in the St. Louis area and then went out for four straight weeks to finish in Florida. Great. Cool. Great. And, you know, I've been wondering, like when doing a, like a tribute to a, an entire genre um, requires a certain level, you know, integrity and respect towards the artists, um, you know, the original artists. And I'm wondering, is there a deeper, like a deeper level of intensity when you're covering other artists' songs as opposed to playing your own music? Like a, it's, it's, I think it's a different kind. Um, you, 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 uh, you know, out of respect, you're, you're, you're uh, doing the best job you possibly can uh, uh, as an homage to their their uh, their originals um, but you want to you know bring as much of your yourself to it as possible right. but you know you have to say as, as true as possible especially with prog stuff you have to there's a lot of signature solos and key parts and, and melodies you have to play right. um, but you know the same person playing the, the same songs that we're playing it's going to sound slightly different you bring a bit of your own personality into it you know so but uh, it's a different kind of intensity for sure for sure, right. And, and the other thing about that yeah, yeah. too is, sorry. No, I was just going to say, I mean, there's a line to walk, but it's not really a fine line. And the reason it's not a fine line, in my opinion, is when you look at the bands that we're covering, they've all gone through so many different changes themselves. So, for yeah. example, you know, when, when we uh, first put some of the promo videos together and we launched Roundabout, and we had some people writing in saying, wow, that's a little heavy for Roundabout. But then somebody writes in and says, haven't you heard Trevor Rabin? So, <laughs> there, there was a genesis with Peter Gabriel and there was a different genesis with right. Bill Collins. There was a yes that had, you know, Jeff Downs and one with Wakeman and then, you know, one with Pat Moraz and one with Steve Howe. So, you know, I think that gives us a little bit of license mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and yeah, you know, we... We love all the bands we're playing, and I think the guys do such an amazing job at delivering the most important aspects of those songs. Like Michael said, some particular melodies and some counterparts sure. have to be there, and we want to play them because they're such an integral part of it. But we've certainly taken some liberties rearranging things, and, and sure. I, I'm certainly playing some different grooves and songs that... Uh, came to me somehow, somewhere, and and the same. With yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, it's funny because uh, one of the one of the tunes we play, which I know I can speak for myself and 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 know that Mike will agree that I love the version of "Have a Cigar" we're doing, and it's not Pink Floyd. the The actual arrangement is from the Roger Waters tour from 1984, uh, "Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking." So it's a little bit of a different vibe. But Michael completely puts his own spin on the vocal itself, which is so different from the way, you know, Gilmore and, well, Roy Hopper and everybody. And right. it's just killing. So it's, it's one of my favorite parts of the night, yeah. guaranteed. Yeah. And something like that is so good that, you know, if, if Floyd heard it today, they might actually call He'd be impressed, right? <laughs> yeah. I guess that's the idea, you know, with it, when you're, you know, doing these cover songs is to, you know, be authentic to the artist, but also you definitely want to add 
You know, I like that you would do that, Michael. You want to add your own spirit in your of course, essence, of course. essence mm -hmm. in there too, right? And yeah, um, yeah. I mean, the melody is essentially the same. I just, right. I got to, I just giving it a little bit more. And right. plus, one last thing on, from my opinion, is that's the other nice thing about not being a tribute to one particular artist, because you're expected if you're doing that to emulate and replicate every exactly. note. Oh, bang and, on! And you got to look right, yeah. like them, and you, yeah, it's. And, yeah. and that was one of the things. It's the only complaint that I really had other than you know it was only a, a short period of time but the only complaint I had about the musical box which they were justified in doing so was you know I got a cold call and the very next day I was doing a three-hour set with no rehearsals so I was able to get them through every gig but I also got them through the gig mostly based on seconds out which is their double live record with Chester Thompson drumming okay. much more than Phil and and even Bill playing one tune so when I got on stage with them and we started playing, I was playing mostly Chester Thompson's parts because that's what I remember listening to and playing mostly too, you know? And so after two or three days of them being ecstatic that I rescued the tour and they were starting to come down to earth and realize that, you know, I'm just a human. We were driving to one gig one day and the, the leader of the band, um, the bass player, Forgive me, I'm forgetting his name right now. He's a really great guy, and I'm just not remembering. But um, uh, he said to me, you know, um, we love that you're playing with us, and it's incredible that what you've done, and thank you so much. And But, you know, if you don't mind, like, in the fourth measure of first... <laughs> you know, you got to be kidding. Yeah, you he know, did not. He did yeah, not. Phil goes from the 14-inch floor to the 12-inch rack. Um, <laughs> and I thought it was a joke. And I was like, oh, okay. And he's like, so could you listen to the studio record and, and learn that? And and I said, really? And he said, oh, yeah, I've got it on my, you know, on my uh, my iPhone if you want to do it right now so you can play it right at the beginning. <laughs> and... You know, I, I listened a little bit and that kind of changed the enjoyment of the gig for me because I, I, wasn't, I wasn't there to be Phil Collins. Right. And so I didn't want anybody in this in this band, you know, it, it really is five guys that that can pick and choose how and what they want to play. And if anybody has a concern about it, somebody would say so. And, you know, uh, Michael might have, you know, uh, something to say about, oh, you know what, maybe don't hit those crash symbols there. And of course, I'll take that into consideration and not do them. So right. it, it's. Or, it, or take it into consideration and completely ignore me. And, and do twice as much. <laughs> um, but, you know, that was one thing is, you know, there has to be, especially with musicians of this caliber, the last thing you want to do is put handcuffs on them and box them into something. And, and I'm, I'm grateful to all of them playing as well as they do, but I'm so happy that the audience comes back to us, including musicians, each night and says, wow, the way you did that was so cool. And, and the nice thing about that is it gives us the opportunity to voice ourselves, and it also gives us the opportunity to not be compared to note for note those people. Because you can't. I mean, yeah, no, that's scrutiny. Nobody can stand up to that. Yeah, right? yeah not night after night. And just yeah. speaking for myself, I mean, you know, Phil Collins, Bill Bruford, you know, John Weathers, Barry Moore Barlow. Sorry, I am no competition. So, you know, I'm very happy doing my thing amongst these other four guys. Right. Now, Michael, it. Who, Michael, who are some of your influences growing oh, up? Is, uh, is it on the uh, well, I mean, the very first, uh, in terms of Prague, um, the, my first introduction was Gentle Giant. Um, I was in a, 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 what was a originally a blues band, just a three-piece blues band, um, which became a sort of jazz, jazz blues, then kind of eventually jazz fusion. -y, and we were in that stage. Um, and the drummer went into Toronto one day. Sorry, I'm just having a few glitches here. Uh, the drummer went into Toronto one day and came back with this import record. And uh, he said, Michael, I got to play something for you. And he put on side one and I listened to it and that finished and there was silence and he put on side two. And I remember at the end of it, uh, uh, I said, I don't know what that is, but I want to start, you know, playing music like that. Yeah. I want to start writing music like that. And it was three friends from Gentle Giant. And I was just, I was like, well, my musical life changed at that moment. So uh, yeah, Gentle Giant was, was, my introduction to that whole world and then it just expanded from there as you know as jonathan says i mean 
uh, it opened the door, it opened my mind to, to I, I couldn't get enough. It's like, what, what else is like, you know, what else, what is in this new genre that I've discovered? And then it became, you know, the yes and the genesis. And, um, it, but it really was, it really was Gentle Giant at the beginning. I got to jump in though. This is, this oh, is you know, Michael Sadler, one of the best singers in the world. You know, I mean, oh. it doesn't get any better, blah, blah, blah. Mike Keneally, one of the great guitar players, you know, a musician that played with Frank Zappa. Oh, I've got my resume, blah, blah, blah. But you should have seen us backstage at Iridium when we found out Derek Shulman oh. came to the show. I mean, we were like 10 year old kids giddy. <laughs> and, and, you know, Eddie Jobson was there too. But Derek Shulman, the lead singer and the leader of, of Gentle Giant, Oh my God! I mean, my my first reaction to that 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 he may be coming by was right. one thing. Mike was like, "What? What? What?" And then finding out that he was actually in the building was what? 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 And before then, we played. I mean, to come into the dressing room before going on stage. Oh, oh just rattle your cage. Really? You hit the stage. No pressure. <laughs> but I mean, we're just we're still such fans, and that's what's yeah, so yeah. cool yeah, about yeah. you know exactly. Yeah, yeah. Was it nerve wracking? Did that make you nervous? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Uh, I, mean, not, I don't think nervous, but of course you, you're thinking, my gosh, you know. Like, I mean, you please, know. Baby Jesus, please, baby Jesus, please, baby Jesus, let everything go properly. <laughs> don't don't let me don't let me forget any of the lyrics. For yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, don't let me yeah. joke. I, it's not a nervousness, but it's no. a really great, excited, psyched. You know, yes, I mean, yeah. we're gonna play for the man that yeah, we yeah. owe so much to. You yes. know, and, yes, and the same thing for Eddie Jobson and. Yeah, it was just just amazing. Yeah, the and fact that also, I mean, the fact that Eddie Jobson there, we were about to do Rendezvous 602, which is yeah. Jobson and Wetton tune. So it was yeah. Rio and I doing that, you know, our version of it. And I'm like, oh, and, and that's a real under the microscope kind of song. Oh, yeah. So you yes, combine so those two things together. I'm like, really? You're going to make me go out there in front of these two guys? <laughs> it was it was just you and Rio? Just you and Rio play that song? Just to do you, to do it? <laughs> you know, is that what it is? <laughs> This is a this is a running concern of Jonathan's. <laughs> every yeah, time so, you guys, every time we play that song, all the people are only talking about you and Rio. Do you not hear me doing the? There's some drums. <laughs> oh no, 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 he's placed some very important musical bits behind us. But we do, Michael and I do know what cartales do to people. Oh yes, we're well, not we can't talk. <laughs> What do they do to people? We want to no, know. No, 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 no. We, we can't go there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, we're on the air. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, but anyway, right. yeah. good. So, and what a testament to the band that they would be out to see you. Yes, yeah. like yeah. right off the bat, just the yeah. fact that yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very awesome. good. super cool. One of those life is good moments. I would have absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We must be one of those. We must be doing something right moments. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. So Lee Canfield, who is a good friend of mine, good friend of the show, he's been looking forward to this all week. I've been going back and forth with him. He says, hello and good evening, Kelly, Michael, and Jonathan, otherwise known as seasoned professional veterans. Very interested in checking out Project Live. Are there any touring plans this summer across Canada? As well, I might give a shout out to Jonathan. Being a drummer myself, just wanted to say I've been a fan of your drumming for a long time. You're a grooving beast on the kit continued success boys thanks lee uh -huh. uh, i'll let you i'll let you take care of the touring question there John. okay well first of all thank you very much i appreciate that um yeah you know as far as touring goes we're going to go out again in the fall and uh, in the winter with some scattered dates uh you know probably in a couple of blocks not too long we are dying to come to canada and we have had so many you know invitations the only thing unfortunately right now is COVID is still uh, an issue yeah. and you know, we we speak we were speaking to some promoters and some agents, and everybody's kind of saying the same thing: is we really can't book it and count on it because if you're going to you know take these ten days and then COVID comes again or you can't yeah. get across the border or something, then we're stuck in the middle right. of a tour in America. So the minute we can, we absolutely will be. But we are going to go out and do more American dates, um, September October area. And then probably West Coast in early December, but next year, um, you know, COVID permitting, it'll right. be national, exactly. and that will be the full-on tour. Yeah. Right, good stuff. Good stuff. Oh, also Michelle Truman, who uh, of course is the lead singer of Toronto, she's in the house. She's just hey, saying, Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Hey, saying hi, guys. Uh, Ricky Lama is saying uh, happy to be tuning in today and seeing you guys. Your comment about how the music could take you back to when you were fifteen is so true, and that is the great thing about music. 100%. Absolutely, hundred percent. 
100%. Uh, Rox Hunter, he's a super talented musician, lives in the Wycon, or uh, in the Yukon, the Wycon. The Wycon, was that a Freudian slip? <laughs> <laughs> Why? Sorry, Rox, we're always talking about Have you ever been to Yosemite? <laughs> <laughs> You're quick, you guys. Are, I bet the uh, tour bus is a fun place. Uh, oh, oh like, yeah, yeah, it's a barrel of laughs, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, Rox is saying, listening from the Yukon, not not the Wycon. <laughs> Thanks for sharing this. Hope these shows are going well. Did Jonathan play on the green with Satriani? Did I play on what? The green. The green. I don't know what the green is, so I guess not. Okay. <laughs> Rox, maybe you can clarify that. I don't know if that's a, not sure if that's a typo or, huh, anyway. I'm sure I, oh, Brad is saying yeah. Montreal would, would welcome you with open arms. I'm sure Montreal would open you with welcome arms. Yeah. Right. So here's a, here's a question for you both, just on, to just kind of go off topic a little bit. So what, it, and I'll start with you, Michael, what do you think is, what have you learned over the years the most, what is one of the most important things you've learned over the years that you maybe wish you knew when you were younger, professionally? Patience. Yeah. <laughs> uh, tolerance. Patience more than anything, I think. You know, you, there's a lot of there's a lot of hurry up and wait, um, right. especially with touring um, and tolerance because things go awry very easily uh, and quite often, and you have to just be prepared. Always be prepared for the worst, and and if anything other than that, anything above that is is a blessing and and is a, a nice surprise. But you know, be prepared for problems along the way because there are going to be some. And right. if you just think it's going to be a, a rosy ride all the way to superstardom or whatever your goal is, uh, you're going to be extremely disappointed because there are going to be bumps in the road. So, yeah. Right. Good. Great. Yep. Yeah. And that's actually good advice, too. And, and move or ask you the same question. I mean, I would certainly agree with that and say the same things. Um, I would say uh, investing in the future, even though I'm okay. Um, I wish I'd known about particular things uh, early on. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that I've learned the older I get that I wish I had acted upon sooner when I was younger was getting rid of bad things as soon as you see them. Right. Whether yeah. it's negativity or a problem or anything like that in business or life or relationship is, you know, when you see something, confront it, and uh, if it doesn't rectify itself, you know, cut it loose as soon as possible. Yeah. Because yeah. you know, everybody, you know, people will take you down. And, you know, when you're doing great things and you've got big dreams and everything like other people don't always have, uh, they don't get it. And uh, they're afraid of it. And they get jealous of it. And, right. Like, right. Yeah. Get rid of yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Well, not a great answer for sure. Um, so actually, Rox is saying that he was speaking about the uh, the Day on the Green concert in Oakland. The Day on the Green concert. If that was when we opened up for the Grateful Dead, I believe, which was a huge AIDS benefit back in the late 80s. Yes, I was playing with Joe at that time. Um, I knew <laughs> that Bill, Bill Graham was managing us and Bill Graham invented Day on the Green. So that's why I'm thinking maybe it was that. If that's the show that he's talking about, which was early on in the trio, yes, that was me playing. I think I was on a small rented white Tama kit. I think there are some videos out there and and that was the show we did, yeah. Right on. Okay, and Rox says, thank you. Awesome interview, awesome musicians and awesome humans. Oh, I would agree. And they're funny. <laughs> they're funny. Rox from the Wycon. I'm never going to live that down after this. <laughs> <laughs> So getting back to the question we were just asking, um, you know, as far as things that you know now that you didn't know back then, I'm wondering too, is because I know for me, the whole COVID really shifted my perspective on things. And do you find that to be true for yourselves, like personally, as well as professionally? Like, my uh, uh, it just, just, just see uh, the, the, it really does kind of put a, uh, a focus on and a microscope on, on the passage of time because, you know, you suddenly, sorry, uh, that's okay. Uh, suddenly, you know, it's like, what do you mean two years went by? What happened to that one particular year? It just doesn't exist. It didn't exist. And it's like everything went on hold for a year. And 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 you, you suddenly go, time is that short anyway. Yeah. And it made, made me go, wait a minute, you know, uh, you can't get that back. So, uh, you know, kind of, I, you might have got to make up for lost time. Or, you know, just, just make the most of the time you have uh, because, you know, it just it just emphasized the fact that uh, 
you know, it's it's pretty fleeting and, uh, you know. Right, yeah, exactly. Mover, mover, how about yourself? I, I absolutely mirror that because it's the first thing that you realize is, like Michael said, two years have gone by. Yeah. And at our age, at my age, those two years are pretty important. Yeah. Um, the other thing that really affected me was somebody somewhere telling me you can't go play in front of an audience right you no know, sorry you got to stay home yeah and you know my career began in touring even though you know i i wanted to see the world while i was young did so, you say in touring did you say your career began in touring mostly yeah i mean I did, oh, okay i did some <laughs> sessions you know in high school and you know i played with bands that recorded like gtr and everything but I really wanted to see the world on, in my younger years. So the first like 10 to 15 years of my professional career was world tour after world tour. I lived right. out of suitcases in hotels and I loved every minute of being in front of an audience because right. I prefer when it comes to making and playing music, even though I love recording for some aspects of it, nothing beats playing live and feeding off of musicians as well as the audience. So after about 15 years of that, living in New York City, I continued drumming, but it was mostly session work for like another 15 years. And I very rarely went out and toured for lengths of time because I had businesses with a recording studio and a magazine that I was doing. Right. So I still played live, but not very much. Then I moved out to LA. One thing led to another, and here I am ready to conquer the world and play live again. And it was taken away from me. And, yeah. and even right now, you know, I said before about, are you going to come to Canada? I cannot tell you how badly we want to be out there playing and playing yeah. all over the place. And, and to know that we can't do that yet. And we don't know when we can do it because, right. oh, there's a surge in New York. Oh, there's a surge in Spain. There's a, yeah. there's a new Omicron variant XYZ. I, I mean, it's being so up in the air along with the clock ticking that Michael just mentioned, yeah. real drag. It's, it's frustrating as hell. It really is. It's just yeah, like, like you say, I mean, Jonathan was talking about, he, he has this idea, we put this thing together, we're dying to do it. And then suddenly, with all this like, enthusiasm is put on hold. So, whoa, it's like, wait a minute, we right. were ready to go. Yeah. And and the, the frustration factor is like monstrous. Like, but, 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 but <laughs> we're, <laughs> no, we're ready, we're ready you know? Yeah. But you know, I think there it makes it. I think it would make almost certain things more sweeter, like that performance, like you said. I think, I think maybe, you know, we. I can't speak for you, but sometimes I think you know you take that for granted, and now yeah. it's, it's like, oh my god, we get to be on stage, you know, like, and and the audience, and, and the audience as well, because you oh, yeah. somebody, they don't have live music for that period of time, and they learn to appreciate just how how cool it is, and 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 how, what a joy it is to see live you know live performances. Right. So so when you finally get back out there, when that's part of uh, what we just realized and felt. People are just overjoyed to be out and watching live music again, and and, mm -hmm. and people really appreciate uh, you know what it's like to go to a concert again. So I agree, and the, and the sad thing is we lost the music when we needed it the most. Yes, and uh, and I feel like people really. I, I I would agree with you. I have a ton of friends. I'm a musician myself. I spent 23 years on the road, and mm -hmm. and so I, I get it. And I have a lot of local musicians too that. Uh, but a lot of the fans have been saying like I never knew what a part live music played in my life until yeah. I didn't have it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we got similar feedback from the venue owners as well mm -hmm. because, you know, we knew that ticket sales could be a little iffy in some pockets. I don't know. Yeah. I, I had at least 50 people that were supposed to come see us in various cities that all said, oh, I got COVID. My wife got COVID. I'm, yeah. I'm taking care of my 90-year-old mother. I can't take a right. chance. Right. But every night, you know, with a great audience that showed up, every venue owner came to us and not only said, wow, you guys were spectacular. We have to have you back. But thank you for playing because yeah. a lot of bands won't go out right yeah. now. We're Take stopped. the chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, it's, 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 you know, it's global. So uh, what, are, what are your future plans? Like in a perfect world, where, where are we going to see projects, say, a year from now, five years from now? Everywhere. <laughs> the world. You know what? You, you, it, it's what we have talked about, and I've, I've said in, in various interviews, and, and Jonathan has as well. Um, the beauty of what we're doing is that there is such a wealth of material for us to to choose from. Um, this we can take this as long as we like. It's not like yeah. you know, oh my gosh, you know, I'd love to get back on tour. We better start working on a new record. 
um, and, and yeah. you know, get something out there so we can go tour again. We could all we have to do is just open the library of music of, of prog music and pick and choose whatever we'd like to put a set together, learn it, and off we go. Um, mm -hmm. and we can just keep varying the set, you know, this to that and this to that, adding this, taking that out. Uh, we can do this for as long as you know people yeah. will have us. Uh, yeah. there's yeah. no shortage, no shortage. of material, <laughs> yeah. 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 And yeah, we're planning 100%. this, you know, to be active every year. We all want to tour. Yeah. We all pl want to play with each other and, and play in front of an audience. And like Michael said, there's new material that we're already, you yeah. know, listening to and learning for the next leg. Yes. And, uh, you know, and, and the other nice thing is everybody, uh, everybody does have something else happening, and, but everybody wants to be able yeah. to balance it accordingly. And mm -hmm. we're all on the same page. So yeah. we'll, we'll be able to do this and other things for many, many years to come. Oh, yeah, it's, it, it, right, up, right, right up to the point where we're sitting in the dressing room and, and one of the stagehands walks rolls in with the wheelchair and I'll look at that and I'll say, <laughs> is that, and I say, is that necessary? And he'll go, I don't know. And he'll say, is it? You know, and, and then, you know, then we'll start well, thinking. The, the question is, who's the wheelchair for? That's the thing. There you go. <laughs> Yeah. You could have duo wheelchairs with, uh, with like tricked out wheels and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right on. Well, you know, I can't thank you guys enough for taking time out of your day and stopping by. And, you know, I, I know I know, I speak on behalf of all the viewers and the Broad Rock fans. Right? Thank you so much for keeping this genre alive. We appreciate no. that. It's, it's our pleasure, literally. It really is Absolutely. our pleasure. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, continue success. And, uh, and I hope that we get to see you in Canada sometime. You soon. will. You will. The minute they'll let me in, I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> With bells on. Maybe yeah. you can make it up to the Wicon, too. Who knows? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I if they'll take I'll, me I'll, yeah. I'll be laying in bed later tonight going I can't believe I yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right on well you guys take care thank you so much and uh, viewers thank you so much for tuning in uh, don't forget to pop in next week Donnie Underhill from Trooper will be here until we see you then take care of each other stay safe and sane be really nice bye bye, bye. thank you bye bye